Bartman Institute. It's my great pleasure to introduce Corey Bartman, who is a Torsten Wiesel professor at Rockefeller University and president of science at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Corey has made many fundamental contributions to a large swath of neuroscience, spanning from the identification of molecules involved in wiring the brain during development to the cellular mechanisms and logic by which neuronal circuits are organized and function, all the way to the characterization of genes and mechanisms responsible for differences in behavior among animals. But since these discoveries are pretty well known, today I'll share with you a lesser known fact about Corey. One of her favorite authors is the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. Like Borges, Cory's work synthesizes erudition with astonishing creativity, clarity of mind, and profound elegance to provide deep insights into how and why animals behave the way they do. Please join me in welcoming Cory. Thank you, Andres. We share a love of the, of the Latin American writers. I want to just start by saying congratulations. Congratulations to Columbia for this fantastic institute. Congratulations to Columbia for the science that has led to that and for the achievements of its distinguished faculty and the students and postdocs in this room. And I want to point out also that I'm the first speaker at the symposium that did not train at Columbia. <laughs> and um, I would like to congratulate Columbia also for the impact it's had through its trainees and the, the work they're doing around the world to carry on that tradition of excellence in neuroscience. And again, as a representative of the outside of neuroscience, I, reflecting on that, I realized that we are all really Columbia trainees um, because of the importance of the, of the education role that Columbia's great principles of neuroscience has over many years had in leading, in educating a huge number of people in the neuroscience community. I think I came along around here, this is the 1991 version, um, but I think we all continue to learn from the erudition, from the tireless work that um, Eric Kandel, Jimmy Schwartz, Tom Jessel, and more recently Steve Siegelbaum and Jim Hudspeth put into um, educating all of us about neuroscience. And in reflecting again today on this institute and on Tom Jessel's recent passing. Um, I want to say also that Columbia has educated neuroscience and had an impact in another very large way, which was through his leadership of the McKnight Foundation, which brought together generations of scientists, um, selected very carefully, spending time together, building a community in which molecular neuroscientists will learn about systems and theorists would learn about neurology, and all of them work together to develop a broader and deeper knowledge of their field. And I think that that is one of the legacies as well as his own work that, and his own trainees that Tom will leave for the field. So um, in studying the nervous system, many of us study the incredibly complex human brain, which has enormously complex anatomy, genetics, and exists and functions over as long as 100 years. But there's also benefit to trying to understand simpler systems that we can understand in their entirety. So the work in my lab focuses on the very simple nervous system of the nematode worm, Cenorhabditis elegans, who, um, that lives for only a few weeks um, and has only a few thousand synapses and a few hundred neurons, but nonetheless is a successful animal. And what I want to point out today in my talk is the way that having um, the complete system helps us to point toward the things that we don't know and to recognize the parts of the element that are not explained by the parts that we understand. So um, there's been a theme actually here in the talk about understanding neural circuits and understanding um, the roles of different neurons in those circuits. In C. elegans, we know not only what all those neurons are, but what all of their anatomical connections with one another are through electron microscopy and reconstruction by John White and his colleagues. But this fixed diagram doesn't give us a complete feeling for what's going on inside of it. And perhaps the most eloquent um, expression of that is the fact that in a uniform environment, animals that are genetically identical to each other can generate distinct behaviors, or even that a single animal can generate different behaviors at different times. So there are spontaneous behaviors elicited by the nervous system. And since the model of neuroscience is often giving a stimulus and looking at the response, 
trying to understand what these spontaneous behaviors are and how those represent the kinds of internal states that indeed each of the three previous speakers spoke about um, is a potential question for neuroscience to address in common with its addressing different kinds of elicited states and sensory driven states. So um, for a simple example of that is a spontaneous behavior pattern that C. elegans shows when placed on a uniform bacterial lawn where it switches back and forth between highly active states where it moves about for a number of minutes and explores new areas and quieter states in which it moves quietly back and forth and moves rather slowly in a small area to eat the food. These are both awake animals. They're these animals are awake at both times, they're moving at both times, feeding and laying eggs, but there's a very different overall behavioral pattern that lasts for minutes at a time. And when he was in my laboratory, Steve Flavel, um, then a postdoc, asked what it was that generated these long-lasting behavioral states, these minutes-long states that seemed too long to be explained by the tools of electrophysiology or even the recurrent activity that was mentioned here. And what he found was that these were controlled by two particular neuromodulators, both of them highly conserved across evolution. One of them, serotonin, seemed to be required to stabilize the dwelling states. Animals lacking serotonin had much shorter dwelling states and reciprocally much longer roaming states. And the opposite one, um, called PDF in invertebrates and VIP invertebrates, had the opposite effect. It was required to stabilize roaming states. Um, animals lacking PDF roamed only for very brief periods of time, where their dwelling states were greatly prolonged. So these converse effects um, give us an insight into the idea that these behavioral states can be controlled not just at the level of individual motor actions, but at the level of their overall duration. And um, the existence of neuromodulators at this point, of course, was was a good discovery in the sense that these are molecules that seem to be implicated in different kinds of long-lasting motivational and emotional states in humans as well as in animals. And perhaps the most eloquent expression of their importance is the fact that they are the targets of the major psychiatric drugs and the targets of the major drugs of abuse or recreational drugs that are used by human beings that because of their ability to affect things like arousal levels or mood stabilization or um, pain and, and related processes. So these are all molecules that function through G-protein coupled signaling as their dominant mode of action. Therefore, they're functioning at the level of biochemistry rather than primarily at the level of electrophysiology. And what we can do in C. elegans when we study them is to not only recognize the particular molecules and their receptors, but to map them onto circuits whose functions we understand in detail. So the foraging circuit that gives rise to both roaming and dwelling has been defined from various neuronal studies. One of the beautiful things about working on an organism with a completely characterized nervous system um, is that you can point to the same neuron in every animal and know that you're studying it and build on the work of others in the field. And we know that there are exactly seven neurons in C. elegans that have the ability to release serotonin. And indeed, three of those neurons are directly connected to the foraging circuit that leads to the complicated patterns of forward and reversal movements characteristic of roaming and dwelling. So Steve asked which of these neurons were important in generating this behavior by individually eliminating the ability of each of these neurons to produce serotonin and determined, somewhat to his surprise, that the neurons that were involved in regulating roaming and dwelling were not the neurons that were directly attached to the foraging circuit, but rather two neurons, um, one in the enteric nervous system, one in the motor system, that come from essentially inside or outside the circuit to modify its activity. And there are multiple sources and multiple targets of serotonin. So it's not a single connection, but rather a multiplicity of connections that lead to the behavioral outcome. And Catherine Dulac's work last night on the different um, projections of different peptide neurons was, was highly reminiscent of this. Similarly, when Steve looked at the PDF neurons, he found the same answer to what they were doing, again, in some contradiction of the wiring diagram of C. elegans. The neurons that produce PDF are, in some cases, completely unattached, in other cases, very far down in the circuit. They there are multiple sites producing it and multiple sites receiving it. And it's, again, the action across this circuit at a distance without anatomically defined synapses that appears to, to represent the activity of the neuromodulators on this circuit. Now, in um, 
So the question is, how do these modify the circuit? What appears to be happening here is this, this highly interconnected circuit, which has many different anatomical synapses shown here. The strength of these synapses or their availability appears to be modified by the action of these neuropeptides, so that the same information flows through it through different behavioral outcomes. So the neurons do not really change. Rather, the strength of the connectivity appears to be what's changing with respect to the modulators. Um, Steve also characterized the activity of these neurons, and there's some interesting features of the modulatory neurons. Um, again, touching on threads that have come up earlier already in the symposium. So for example, when he examined the activity of one of the major serotonergic modulatory neurons called NSM, he found two things of interest. The first is that its activity is synchronized with state transitions. When the animal switches from a roaming to a dwelling state, NSM becomes more active. So it's not sort of generally permissive, but actually coupled to the behavioral outcome. And second, its activity um, is long-lasting, that most neurons associated with individual actions would have activity states on a second or sub-second time scale related to that of the behavior. But these serotonergic neurons are active here for several minutes at a stretch, consistent with the minutes-long um, representation of the behavior in, of the animal. So different classes of neurons seem to have activity patterns that are related to their output. Again, quite similar to the things that David mentioned in Drosophila for a subset of the neurons involved in mating. So we, have, we can get from this work and work in other experimental systems and work in other modulatory systems in C. elegans a picture of what modulators are doing to a wiring diagram that a wiring diagram represents a set of options, a set of potential behaviors open to the animal, and that the neuromodulators help select among those options to give rise to different behaviors in association with different internal states. So their wiring is orthogonal to that of fast circuits, and it's with distributed sources and receptors. We can't just read it off of the, we can't just read it off of the anatomy. Um, the sources neurons seem to have long-lasting activity, and we've seen that in other contexts as well, compared to neurons directly involved in individual actions. They seem to select among connections to reroute information flow, and through that they organize higher-order coordinated circuit states by inducing and induce and prolong behavioral states. Finally, they act on long time scales. They can act over time scales of minutes or hours or days. I showed you Steve's work that shows their activity over the time course of minutes. Activity over the time course of days was shown by another postdoc in the lab, Shai Stern, who um, had, has developed methods for monitoring the behavior of C. elegans across its entire developmental lifespan. So, um, Shai had developed a system of trying to monitor different kinds of behavioral states, starting with individual animals at, as the time of hatching and monitoring over the, them over the two and a half day period of their growth to adulthood. Each animal is individually examined in a controlled environment. And in this case, he was looking at the same roaming and dwelling parameter that Steve was looking at. Each of these dots represents a 10 minute interval and each row represents an individual animal the white lines here are the molts that separate larval stages. And what Shai could see is not only do individual animals both roam and dwell, but there's a developmental trajectory of those behaviors, where, for example, um, first larval stage animals are relatively quiet with a lot of dwelling and not much roaming, indicated by the cool colors, whereas, for example, at the first half of the third larval stage, animals are extremely active before settling into a very quiet stage with a lot of dwelling. So there are long-term developmental trajectories of behavior that are superimposed on the short-term minute-in-minute trajectories that um, Steve described. And when Shai asked what might be involved in those behaviors, again, what he found is that those developmental trajectories are under the control of neuromodulators in ways that are parallel to, but somewhat interestingly different from, the ways that they control minute-to-minute -minute trajectories. So I showed you earlier that serotonin was required for stable dwelling behaviors. And consistent with that, you can see that all across development, animals lacking serotonin have a larger number of these hot colors indicating a high level of roaming behavior. 
but the overall structure of the timing is normal in serotonin deficient mutants. So for example, you still see a lot of roaming in the first half of the third larval stage compared to the second larval stage. It's basically a multiplication of the degree of roaming at every stage of development. Other molecules, such as this molecule here, a neuropeptide receptor, also has a lot of roaming-related behaviors, but those behaviors have now lost the overall developmental structure characteristic of the wild type. That's easiest to see in the first larval stage, where these animals are extremely active immediately after hatching, where they just tear out of the eggshell and run around, whereas the wild type is quite quiet in those first few hours. So neuromodulators are both minute-to-minute -minute regulators and also apparently longer-term, potentially developmental regulators of behavioral states. So these questions are giving us one view of what the, the, how the wiring diagram responds to different inputs. We have a set of neurons that detect sensory inputs, which are traditionally shown at the top of the diagram, flows of information through these highly complex interconnected systems, and then ultimately the expression of that information in individual output neurons. Now, our thinking with the modulators has really been about the connectivity between these neurons, but one thing that has lagged behind in C. elegans is an understanding of how neuronal dynamics might be contributing to this kind of outcome. And that's because this is a system that's not very tractable to electrophysiology, and only a handful of people are able to uh, monitor neurons in detail. I've been extremely fortunate in that one of those people, uh, Chung Lu, has been a research scientist in my lab for the past few years, and he has undertaken a systematic characterization of the C. elegans nervous system, recording from individual neurons and characterizing their properties. Now, Chung has recorded at this point from about 20% of the neurons in the C. elegans nervous system. And here are three neurons um, with very distinctly different properties, um, showing their sort of input voltage current relationships under different, under different conditions, under standard conditions. We can see that they're different. For example, this bistable neuron might be predicted to have very different functions in a circuit than this more smoothly graded neuron here. But one of the things that Chung found that came as a surprise to us was this neuron here, um, which again, in the same kind of current clamp configuration, showed some bistability with low and high activity states, graded properties characteristic of C. elegans neurons, but also showed this um, unexpected pattern of activity here, in which um, small, short, sharp intervals of activity are superimposed on a baseline. Now, these patterns of activity look completely normal to everyone else in this room because these are obviously action potentials, but C. elegans does not have action potentials, and it's been known for 30 years not to have action potentials, and there are lots of good reasons for thinking that it does not have action potentials, and so we were surprised. Um, and so just looking up in neuroscience textbooks, for example, we can turn to this excellent resource, Neuroscience for Kids, and determine that the molecular basis of the action potential is a voltage-gated sodium channel. And voltage-gated sodium channels are not present in the C. elegans genome or, in fact, in the genome of any nematode. So um, it does not look as though that should be present, and indeed these have not been observed to be present. But if we look at these somewhat more um, sophisticated site here, teachmephysiology.com, we find that there are other ways of generating action potentials, for example, in the heart, in which calcium channels, voltage-gated calcium channels, can be the, the source of depolarization. And indeed, C. elegans has voltage-gated calcium channels um, of all of the conserved classes that are present in other animals. And when Chung looked carefully, at um, the action potentials with different ion substitution experiments or with using different kinds of um, genetic mutations to alter different molecules, he was able to find that while removing calcium eliminated the action potentials um, while sparing the graded activity of the neuron, or eliminating the um, voltage-activated calcium channel, CAB1 channel, um, also eliminated the action potentials, um, they continue to persist in the presence of sodium. So it's a calcium-based action potential terminated by a classical shaker-type potassium channel that gives rise to these properties. So this is a little bit of, this is a little bit of a surprise, perhaps a quirk, but the thing that struck us about it is that knowing that action potentials have been really hard to observe in C. elegans maybe gives us a way of thinking about what they might be doing um, in a more refined environment. Why would a neuron that, why would a 
animal that does not use this kind of signaling very frequently suddenly choose to use it in one neuron at one time? And I want to say a couple things about it, and I'm going to come back to these points. One is that the action potentials are always fired after a delay, and that's one of the reasons they hadn't been seen before, is that typically people will only like um, clamp the neuron for a second or half a second, and there are no action potentials until about a second after the animal has, the neuron has been depolarized. So there's something in there where the neuron is waiting or resisting giving rise to this kind of signal. Um, the second thing is that we know a lot about this particular neuron and what its role is in behavior. This is an olfactory neuron. It's involved in chemotaxis behaviors, and it has a very um, robust response, as originally shown by Johannes Larsch in the lab, to a very particular kind of olfactory signal. This is work that Johannes did using genetically encoded calcium indicators in vivo to look at the activity of this neuron. And what he found is that the neuron would respond to odors, but only transiently, and then would very rapidly stop responding unless you gave it a little more odor. And it, each time you slightly increase the odor levels, the neuron would respond again with this transient and terminating signal. And so this suggests that what this neuron is, do is, is specifically tuned to climbing odor levels, and in particular to the task of gradient climbing. And so sort of armed with that information, Chung went back and did small current increases in the neuron while recording electrophysiologically. And indeed, while the first stimulus um, gives a delayed set of action potentials, each successive small rise in activity gives rise to action potentials that are precisely aligned with the increase in current. So this neuron is tuned to a very particular input. It doesn't really, it will only give graded signals or delayed signals if there's a constant odor level, but if odor levels are climbing, it will send this very specific signal onward. So um, thinking about this further, May Devashevitz, a graduate student who's currently in the lab, actually who graduated last week, so now a postdoc who's currently in the lab, um, has been trying to deliver controlled signals of different sorts to understand the activity in the circuit. And May started um, by basically using, again, genetically encoded calcium indicators, which have been most of her work, um, using different odors that we know activate this neuron at different concentrations, and also then artificially activating the neuron using channel rhodopsin so she could deliver a well-controlled stimulus. And we can actually calibrate the channel rhodopsin stimulus and say that it resembles basically a particular odor at this concentration of nanomolar to micromolar in its kinetics and its um, responses. So what May wanted to do was to look one synapse downstream of the sensory neuron to see how this information was propagated. Um, and so she then recorded, she stimulated the sensory neuron with channel rhodopsin and then recorded calcium signals in the neuron one synapse away that is coupled to the sensory neuron with gap junctions. And when she used odor, she found a very robust and reliable response in this downstream inner neuron. But when she used channel rhodopsin, she found something quite different. First of all, um, the responses were only present in a fraction of the animals. It's only about 40% of the animals compared to nearly 100%. And second, they were delayed. So there's something very different about propagating the signal from the natural odor and propagating a comparable signal, we think, from channel rhodopsin across the synapse that literally leads to, on average, a seven-second lag between any sort of a response downstream. Surprising. So what does this weak response mean? Um, May looked very carefully at the responses, aligning them not by the activation of the sensory neuron, but rather by the activation of the downstream neuron. And when she did that, she saw that these downstream responses, although they were much less frequent with um, crimson activation, in fact had exactly the same magnitude and exactly the same dynamics as those induced by odors. They were transient responses here in the calcium levels. They're all or none. The latency and probability of these responses varies depending on the stimulus, but the character of those responses does not vary. And armed now with this idea of a stereotypic response and a response that's only elicited under very specific circumstances, um, we started to think about action potentials again, and so May recruited Chung, and Chung determined that these AIA neurons also have action potentials. They have action potentials that fire in small bursts, in this case without a delay, a different threshold, a higher frequency, and a slightly different ionic basis than that in um, 
the sensory neurons. So now we have two neuron classes that fire action potentials um, under specific circumstances. But in this case, again, apparently a very selective set of circumstances, we can't elicit them with an artificial stimulus. And um, May and Chung together have done a, fair, a number of experiments to try to determine what it is that determines when the AIA neuron is allowed to fire action potentials and what gates that. And what they found is that um, while this connection is strong and direct, there are also a set of inhibitory glutamatergic synapses that are balanced against um, the excitatory input from the other olfactory neuron. Um, and these inhibitory neurons prevent the, get the transmission of that information. And um, they demonstrated this by using tissue-specific knockouts to selectively knock out glutamate in just this handful of sensory neurons here, and found that by doing so, she could now transmit, using just this optogenetic signal, um, a very efficient activation of the downstream neurons. And um, Chung found that, in fact, there is a glutamate-gated chloride channel in the AIA neuron, which is the site of rapid inhibition. And I'm not, I may not be a biophysicist, but I'm pretty sure that a neuron that's um, clamped at minus 50 millivolts is not going to be firing action potentials. So um, this get, provides a circuit-level explanation for the fact that this neuron is actually only activated by very specific outcomes. And May has looked more carefully at the sensory neurons. Um, it turns out that some of these other sensory neurons respond to the same odor that gives rise to um, this strong stimulus in the inner neuron. However, they are not sufficient. Their inputs are relatively weak. Simply removing their inhibition of the stimulus is not sufficient to activate the downstream neuron. It requires both the activation of one sensory neuron and the inhibition of the others to, to activate the downstream neuron. So what we're seeing is that even one synapse away from a sensory neuron we're getting a global sensory state with a very, uh, where basically information is only being propagated if it meets a whole set of criteria, including, the, including activation of one set of neurons, inhibition of another neurons, and then the transmission of this output. And Chung has been looking more broadly now kind of with this idea of specialized stimuli, and he's identified two additional classes of neurons that also fire action potentials under selective circumstances. And, um, now that we have four classes of neurons, um, we are at least mentally playing with the idea that perhaps many neurons have both graded states in which they're transmitting some amount of information through the system, but also many neurons have the capability of developing these stronger signals that will then drive a circuit into a particular state. Um, there's nothing special about the calcium channel or the potassium channel that's driving the action potentials in AWA. It's, they're present in many neurons. It's just a question of whether they're available with the right set of sensory or synaptic inputs that allow them to happen. So um, what we're seeing here is that both precision and variability are included in the nervous system. That's something that we thought was a variable response. It's like, oh, it's just really poor transmission of information across the synapse. Turns out to, in fact, be a very precise response. Information is only transmitted if certain circumstances are met, which only happens some of the time. And we still have a lot to learn about these um, in terms of thinking about um, the ways that the, the time scales map across these initial kinds of synaptic and electrical properties and these larger biochemical properties, but there's still lots to learn. So with that, I will just uh, show you the people in the lab who did the work. Chang Liu is the electrophysiologist who's been studying the action potential system, May Deba Chabots, um, just graduated, who's been looking at the transmission of information across the synapse. I told you earlier about work of neuromodulators done by um, Steve Pavel, now a faculty member at MIT, Shai Stern, who just started his own lab at the Technion, and Christoph Kirst, who is about to start his lab um, at UCSF. Thank you. Wow, fantastic talk. So much for textbooks. Huh? <laughs> Good. So we have some questions. We can start here. It's better because people, it's being strange. So, so Corey, your, your current clamp records, even before the calcium spikes, showed some really nice nonlinearities and rectifications. So is that all accounted for by the A current? Are there additional voltage-dependent currents there? Or is this a circuit 
phenomenon in which some sort of synaptic input from others, perhaps gap junction activated, is in fact contributing to how the input resistance changes? Yeah, the, the, there are quite um, interesting dynamics to the graded responses of all of the neurons. They're probably largely circuit independent, just the dissection you need to do to get an electrode on, patched onto these cells probably rips most of the circuit elements out of it. Um, C. elegans has 80 predicted potassium channels encoded, encoded in its genome, included 20-something in the voltage-activated potassium channel family. We know that multiple potassium channels um, are, in, are expressed in this neuron and actually contribute to the response. In fact, there's um, there's sort of key elements that include sort of a slow rise. It has to do with the slowly inactivating potassium channel that's absolutely required for this response to, to sort of bracket where the response occurs. So yes, it's probably quite, um, there are a lot of inputs. The A current is just the termination current. Mm -hmm. Frank, uh, right there. Um, Corey, could, could you also imagine that uh, those voltage-gated calcium channels could be differentially distributed in the cells, or they're either they're abundant or they're clustering. Do you have something that would look like an AIS? Or? Yeah, so we have looked at time. We, so it is possible to actually tag the voltage-activated calcium channels in vivo. We have not done it carefully here. Um, I don't know about the molecular basis, but I can tell you that quite a few neurons in C. elegans have localized calcium activity that, are, that is activity that is localized, for example, to a patch of the axon or dendrite and not transmitted through the cell body accurately. So whether that is calcium sequestration or activation or inactivation or actually physical localization of the calcium channel, I can't tell you, but there's clear compartmentalization. But presumably voltage, there's, the neurons are small enough that they're thought, to, they're thought to be isopotential even if calcium signals can be local and therefore, for example, release could be local. Yeah. Corey. Is there any evidence for um, a very short-term type of plasticity now that you identify this? For example, if there's recency in the activation of these neurons, are there cellular mechanisms that either facilitate further responses or inhibit for a while? So can you explain the idea that I think a few years ago you were pioneering of the current state mattering a lot for the mm -hmm. response to the input into uh, the recency of events at a particular cell, for example? And, um, I, I, think, I think I don't have a great answer for your question in terms of recency and plasticity that, um, that fall. I, I don't think I have a great answer to that question. There are, idea, there are pretty clear examples of current state affecting the outcome that are related to a lot of the sort of global state dynamics and mm -hmm. manifolds that people see across different nervous systems sure. now. Essentially that your position within a general activity manifold um, on a short mm -hmm. term will affect your sensitivity to certain kinds of inputs. But for example, in. is there a refractory period of these action yeah. potentials, for example? Uh, I don't think we've looked at that carefully. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Corey. Now we have some.